Hello, everybody. Welcome again. Welcome again. I believe God has got good things in his word for us. There's just so much in there. I've been reading the Bible since I was a little girl, and I'm still discovering treasures old and new, things that I've seen before, things that I'm seeing for the first time. I love the word of God. Love to just dig in deep and find out the goodness of God through his word. I want to thank you this week because I know I was talking to Nico just a few minutes before and you've very clearly been praying for us. There's been times when we felt waves of it, myself, Sam, and obviously especially Nico and Abby. We've just felt an extra sense of the presence of God. We've felt the blessing. We've felt the life. And sometimes I've been doing something and all of a sudden I've felt it, waves of his presence. One morning in particular, I woke up and God was there in a different way. And I believe it's just prayer. And you, you're just lifting us all up. And I just thank you. I think we don't realize sometimes how powerful it is when we pray for each other. But Nico, Abby, Sam and myself and others, we're just benefiting so much from it. Keep praying, especially for, for Nico and Abby. They're doing remarkably well. It's really tough. But God is faithful and they're doing really, really well. And the whole family too. They need your prayer at this time. So let's, let's just pray for the session and for them. Lord, we just thank you that we can cry out to you. Thank you that our cries reach your ears and your heart, that you hear and that you answer. Thank you, Lord, that when we have needs, Lord, we can lift them up to you. Thank you that the people we love, Lord, we can bring them and their needs before you. And you're faithful to answer, to bless, to sustain. I thank you that you're an, a God that isn't afar off, but you hear and you feel and you know and you respond. Pray that you would just hold Abby's heart and mind in your hand, Lord, that you'd bless her, that you'd protect her, that you'd comfort her and Nico and the whole family. Lord, that you'd give Nico wisdom in every conversation and in every decision. Be so present, so close for both of them by day and by night, Lord. The whole family, the whole family. Thank you, Lord, that you've put us in a family together. Thank you for the relationships that you give to us. They're so precious and they make such a difference. Pray that you would just be with us by your spirit as we share your word. And I pray, Lord, that it would be a blessing to us, that we would be fed and instructed and encouraged as we look into your word together. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, this week I want to look at Caleb. He is one of my favorite Bible personalities. And there's a lot of things that I kind of identify with and that I enjoy about Caleb. Now, the f what we hear of him the first time, or, where, you know, he's, they're going to send the spies into the land of Canaan. It's not long since they've come out of Egypt. They've come towards the land of Canaan for the first time, and somebody suggests sending in spies. So they call for a leader from each of the tribes, and Caleb is the leader for the tribe of Judah, so he gets to go. He is one of the tribal leaders. He is, and Joshua is. So they go. Let's read. Let's read from Numbers chapter 14, verses 6 to 10, and I'm reading from the New Living. Two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Jephunneh, tore their clothing. They said to all the people of Israel, The land we travelled through and explored is a wonderful land, and if the Lord is pleased with us, 
he will bring us safely into that land and give it to us. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. But the whole community began to talk about stoning Joshua and Caleb. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites at the tabernacle. And then going back to verse 13, it explains a little bit of why. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too. So these 12 spies go and 10 bring back a bad report. Only Joshua and Caleb bring back a good report. Actually, in comparison to a lot of situations, that's not a bad percentage. Sometimes it's hard to find that percentage of faithful people, but they were really faithful. Some people, all they saw were the difficulties, the big fortified cities and the giants. That was all that they saw. They saw that the land was good, but the thing that really impressed them and impacted them was these big walled cities and these big fierce giants. But Joshua and Caleb, they were men of faith. And they said, look, if God's given it to us, it's not a problem. If God said it's ours, then it's ours. Let's go for it. Let's go up. Let's take the land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he'll bring us safely. And they are only helpless prey to us. People saw that the strength of these giants would protect them. But Joshua and Caleb, they saw the strength of God's word. They saw the strength of God's promise. And they weren't impressed with human strength, which is a good thing because the people of Israel wanted to stone them. They brought a good report. They brought a truthful report. And it wasn't what people wanted to hear. And they wanted to stone Joshua and Caleb. Sometimes when you see the truth, people don't like it. Sometimes we're not popular. Sometimes when we want to be faithful to what God says, people are challenged by it and they don't like it. And they can get really hostile. So in a way, they had two enemies. They had the giants but they also had their own people that were taking a stand against them, and yet they remained faithful to God and faithful to his word. And do you remember the old Sunday school song, you know, 10 spies went to spy in Cain and 10 were bad, two were good. And then it goes on, some saw the giants tough and tall, some saw the grapes in clusters fall, some saw that God was in it all. 10 were bad and two were good. They said to the people, don't rebel against God. It was like they were putting their opinion above what God said. It's too much for us. We can't do it. We can't do it. And they rebelled against God. And when things are impossible to us, when things feel overwhelming, how do we respond? What do we do when things are too much for us? Well, they rebelled. Whereas Joshua and Caleb, they, they trusted. They trusted God and they trusted his word. It's interesting as well, the ten unfaithful spies, they said, next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too. How we see ourselves is really important. They... I guess they'd not even heard anybody. I don't know whether somebody would said you're only grasshoppers. But that was their opinion of themselves. And I was thinking about David when he faced a giant. He didn't see himself as a grasshopper. 
he didn't see himself as a dead dog, which is what um, Goliath called him. All he saw was that the giants were really foolish to stand against what God was saying. David couldn't, he, he just thought it was crazy that Goliath thought he stood a chance against God. He just trusted God. It wasn't, here I am, the big hero. It was, I'm coming in the name of the Lord. It's you that should be afraid, not me. Such a security, such a rootedness, such a confidence in God. Not in his own opinion, he was a boy a y or a young man. He wasn't a seasoned warrior in that sense. And Joshua and Caleb, I mean, they were mature men, but still their confidence was not in man. It wasn't in themselves. It was in God. And they didn't see themselves as grasshoppers. And even though the giants were much bigger, had resources that they didn't, they knew their God. Those that know their God will be strong and do exploits. We need to know our God and we need to be willing to go on adventures with our God and we'll see him do great, great things. The land we explored is good. They have no protection. The Lord is with us. When were you last afraid? And what were you afraid of? The Lord is our protection. He is our guard. He goes before us. He stands behind us. And he's faithful. And he's good. Numbers 13 verse 30 says, Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly con conquer it. But the people didn't want to know. They didn't want to know. They didn't trust. And they didn't want to know. Some of it is about identity. Who we see ourselves as. Who we really are. And we've talked about the grasshoppers. And Caleb just saw himself as coming in the name of the Lord. He saw that he had an authority that came from God. And authority is a powerful thing. He saw that God had given them the authority to take the land. And when God gives authority, he backs up the authority that he gives. He doesn't just tell us to do something and then leave us to fend for ourselves. He equips, he empowers, he is faithful. And Joshua and Caleb, they understood that authority. And Caleb, he, he tried to say to the people, but God said, but they didn't want to. Th they were too full of fear, too full of doubt, too full of their own opinions. Caleb, his name, it means like dogged determination, tenacity, a real long-term person. He was somebody that really believed what he believed. He, uh, you know, he goes for the long haul. He isn't somebody that is like a fair weather friend. Dogged determination. He is somebody like a marathon runner that's going to keep going till they finish the race. That's what his name implies. That's who he is. And it shows it was not just his name, it was his whole identity. And that was who he was. And he wasn't about to be swayed one way or the other. That was his name. That was his nature. That was what his parents saw and spoke into him. Joshua, he started out being called O'Shea. And his name, it means salvation. And Moses changed his name to mean J. O'Shea or Joshua, which means Jehovah is salvation. And if we think that we can be our own salvation, we're not going to get very far. So Joshua had his name changed to include the fact that it's God who is our salvation. And who you see yourself as, it makes such a difference. 
if you have that security of your identity in Christ, so that when you go into a situation and you know you're out of your depth, but you know that God's put you there, there's such a security. Whereas if you're out of your depth and you feel it all hangs on you, you're not going to be very happy, are you? And you're not going to be fruitful and you're not going to be productive. But if we know who God has called us to be and we know that he is not just with us, but in us, alongside us, strengthening us, giving us wisdom, giving us anointing, giving us refreshing, then it makes such a difference. And he is the one that gives us the grace and the strength to go the distance. Numbers 14 verses 23 to 24 is very sad. It's very sad. Talking about the people of Israel. And it says, they will never even see the land I swore to give their ancestors. None of those who have treated me with contempt will ever see it. But my servant Caleb has a different attitude than the others here. He has remained loyal to me. So I will bring him into the land he explored. His descendants will possess their full share of that land. Our attitude, what's your attitude to difficulties? What's your attitude when you're not popular? What's your attitude when something is impossible? What's your attitude when everybody's telling you that you're wrong? Now, if everybody's telling you that you're wrong and you are wrong, then you need to be mature enough to see it. If it's just your own conclusions or your own ideas, then you need to be big enough to know when you're wrong. But if it's what God has said and you know that it's God's word, then what is your attitude when things are really difficult? What is your attitude? He had a different attitude. And his attitude was that he knew that what God said was true and that he would see it through. His attitude was to never treat God with contempt. When we don't believe him, what are we saying? What actually does it mean when we don't believe and trust God? Well, it says here that by not believing God, they were treating him with contempt. We don't always think it through what our attitude really means. But when we don't trust God, what are we saying? Are we saying, you don't have the power? Are we saying, you don't love me enough? Are we saying, you don't know what's happening? What are we saying to God when we don't trust him? You might not be consciously saying these things, but your lack of trust or your lack of obedience is saying some very negative things about God. And I don't want to be found treating God with contempt. He doesn't mind if we ask him for reassurance. He doesn't mind if we ask him to explain things. And sometimes he won't and sometimes he will. But God doesn't mind us asking questions. He doesn't mind us asking him for strength and support. He doesn't mind if we need help. But he does mind if we don't trust him. Have you ever felt insulted when somebody didn't trust you or wasn't loyal to you? I know I found it really hurtful when people have questioned my word and when I've been speaking the truth. I found it really hurtful when people have been disloyal. I found it really hurtful when people haven't trusted. Some people it doesn't matter, but some people it does. And to God it matters. It matters if you don't trust him. It matters if you don't believe him. It's a big deal because he loves you. Not because you earn it, but because he loves you, because he's your father and he loves you. And it's all about heart. It's all about heart. Numbers chapter 26, verse 65, it says, For the Lord had said of them, 
they will all die in the wilderness. Not one of them survived except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. And then in Numbers 32, verses 11 and 12, it says, Of all those I rescued from Egypt, no one who is 20 years old or older will ever see the land that I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for they have not obeyed me wholeheartedly. The only exceptions are Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, son of Nun, for they have wholeheartedly followed the Lord. It doesn't say really anything about Caleb in all the 40 years. It doesn't say anything much about Caleb. But at the end of that 40 years, he was still leading his tribe faithfully. All through the wilderness time, he remained the leader of the tribe of Judah and he served faithfully through all the journeyings, through all the difficulties, when the people rebelled, when it was just the daily slog, he continued to serve, he continued to show up, he continued to be faithful. Joshua was, was raised up as the leader. He was Moses' assistant, and when Moses died, he was there to take on the leadership. And we don't see anything about Caleb resenting that. We don't see anything of envy, jealousy. Um, some people got really jealous of Moses and Aaron, and they tried to push them off. They tried to um, stop them, you know, tried to push them out of their positions. They rebelled against them as they rebelled against God. Caleb never did that. He never said, well, I was as faithful as you. And he never resented. He just continued. And sometimes we have the times when God is doing amazing things. Sometimes God is really doing things in our hearts, in our lives. Sometimes he's changing things. But sometimes, like in that instance, for 40 years he just served faithfully faithfully, faithfully, one step after another step after another step. Faithful in his relationship with God, faithful in his trust, and faithful in his care for his family and for his tribe. He just stuck at it according to his nature, just kept going and kept going. And at the end of that 40 years, he was still believing God. The promise that God gave him was still fresh in his heart. He still believed it every bit as much. Maybe he believed it more, but he certainly still believed it. He didn't say after a year or two, well, God's not done what he said. I'm going off. For 40 years, he continued to be faithful. And for 40 years, all through the wilderness, he continued to walk with God. It isn't the cleverest and the strongest that prevail. It's the believers. It's those that believe. It's those that trust. It's those that are wholeheartedly. It's, he didn't just obey God grudgingly. He didn't obey God just out of habit. He obeyed God wholeheartedly. God can work with a man or a woman like that. God can do things through a man or a woman like that. He can sustain them and he can enable them and he can keep hope and promises alive and fresh and then he can fulfill them. Caleb followed wholeheartedly and led his people wholeheartedly. He's such a good God. So, they come back to the promised land. Most of the people that came there the first time are dead and gone. And this is what Caleb says. This is in Joshua chapter 14, verses 7 and 8. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land of Canaan. I returned and gave 
an honest report. But my brothers who went with me frightened the people from entering the promised land. For my part, I wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. A lot of the report that the other spies brought was true. It was true that there were giants. It was true that there were walled cities. God doesn't expect us to gloss over the difficulties. It's okay to be honest about the difficulties. But Caleb's report was a more honest report because it was in the light of the goodness of God. Some people would have said that he was living in la-la land. Some people would have said that he was living a fantasy to think that that land could be conquered, that those giants could be conquered. But the truth was the goodness of God. The truth was the promise of God. And what Caleb shared was the truth. We can possess it. We can go in and we can take it and we can do it. What they said was part true, but he had the whole truth. He saw the truth of the kingdom of God as well as the natural realm. If we're just seeing what's going on in the natural realm, we've only got a little part of the story. Do you know what we can't see is actually more real than what we can see? And sometimes if we believe what God says, he actually allows us to see the things that other people can't see. He allows us to experience the things that we can only know as we begin to explore the kingdom of God. Because we're meant to be supernatural people and we're able to begin to explore the kingdom of God. We're able to begin to hear his voice and see his goodness and see things that other people can't see. And Caleb saw a reality that other people couldn't see. And because they couldn't see it, they didn't think it was real. But guess what? It was real. It was real. And it still is. It still is. What God says is not wishful thinking. It's the most real thing in the universe. Faithfulness. In Numbers chapter 34 and verse 29, it says about the men that were appointed to divide the grants of land. And again, it talks about the tribal leaders. And like I say, Caleb was still there being the tribal leader. 40 years later, I want to be found faithful. There are promises that I've had in my heart for a long time. And I know, I know that my God is faithful because I've seen him keep his promises. And because you know, some people, you meet them and you just know that they are honest people. You know that they are truthful, faithful people. Some people you can trust easily. And when I've been in God's presence and I know that he is a faithful person. I know that he is a good person and he has kept many promises to me and changed many situations and he has been good. It's good as well. We see that Caleb's family they inherited the blessings because Caleb was faithful the generations that came after him inherited what he gained and what he possessed it wasn't just for him it was for his children too it says in Deuteronomy 1 verse 36 it says he will see the land because he followed the Lord completely. I will give to him and his descendants some of the very land he explored during his scouting mission. Your children will benefit from your faithfulness. Your children will benefit from the fact that you are faithful to God. It isn't just you that will benefit, your children will benefit too. You'll leave them a godly heritage. Whether they choose to walk in that heritage, they have a choice. But nevertheless, there are blessings that your children will receive because you choose to be faithful to God. And because you hang on to that truth, because you hold it in your heart. So 
it's interesting because Hebron, which was the land that Caleb inherited, was where Abraham entered into covenant with God. He got a good bit of land. It was a piece of land that was precious in the eyes of God. And I also think that because that was, well, le let's go back a step. He gets a allotted this piece of land. He asks Joshua for his portion and he gets given his portion. And actually the bit that he gets given is the bit where the giants actually are. And I think the giants were actually there because it was the best bit. God had given him the faith. So he was the one that had to do the job. He was the one that had to deal with the giants. And he had the faith to do it. He had the trust to do it. Many of the other areas of the land, they were never fully cleared. And there were always people in there that caused the problem. There were people there that caused temptation. There were people there that caused unrest. But in Caleb's portion, he cleared his portion. Joshua 15, verse 14 to 19, it says, Caleb drove out the three groups of Anakites, the descendants of Sheshai, Ahiman, and Talmai, the sons of Anak. From there he went to fight against the people living in the town of Debir, formerly called Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, I will give my daughter Aksa in marriage to the one who attacks and captures Kiriath Sefer. Othniel, the son of Caleb's brother Kenaz, was the one who captured it, so Aksa became Othniel's wife. When Aksa married Othniel, she urged him to ask her father for a field. As she got down off the donkey, Caleb asked her, What's the matter? She said, Give me another gift. You have already given me land in the Negev. Now please give me springs of water too. So Caleb gave her the upper and lower springs. Caleb didn't just do all the work himself. Caleb didn't just do everything. He This thing of inheritance. And part of his in the, the inheritance that he wanted to leave was he wanted his daughter to marry a good man. So he sent out a challenge and Othniel stepped up to the challenge and he defeated. Uh, he, he came in and he plowed in there and he came and he fought the giants too. And I don't think that Caleb was offering up his daughter as like a, a raffle prize, you know. Anybody that's big enough to, to do this job, I'll give them my daughter as a motivation. I think it was the other way around. He wanted a man that would prove himself faithful and trusting in God. He wanted the right man. He wanted somebody that was full of faith, full of trust, full of courage. Courage is an amazing thing as long as it's rooted in the nature and the goodness of God. And Othniel came and he rose to the occasion. And I think that that was just fantastic. Um, I just think it was so good that he stood up and took that that role. And his name actually means Lion of God. Lion of God. And he came and Caleb not only had the faith to clear the land for him to possess it, but he also prepared for the future. And down the road, when Israel got into a mess, they cried out to God for a deliverer. And God raised up Othniel to be that deliverer. And Caleb had trained him. Caleb had opened the door for him to have adventures with God. Sometimes we're not meant to do all the things ourselves. Sometimes we're meant to raise up somebody else to also walk in adventures and in courage and do things. And Caleb wanted to leave a good inheritance. I love the fact that his daughter was given an inheritance of land. So good. In those days, not many fathers gave their daughters an inheritance, but he was a good guy. He was a godly man and he loved his daughter, I guess. 
and he wanted to have a good husband and a good inheritance for that daughter. And I also love the fact that, as we read, she then came to her father and said, you've given me land, give me also springs of water. No matter what inheritance you have in God, you need the life of God. No matter what he gives you in terms of ministry, blessings, possession, if you don't remain tapped in to the life of God, it won't be good. Whatever you have, make sure that those springs, make sure that that life of God is central to all that you have and all that you are and all that you do. Never be afraid to ask your father for springs of water. His daughter, Axa, she asked him for springs of water. And wherever God takes you, whatever he gives you, whatever he asks you to do, make sure that you draw from those wells of salvation, that that living water is a central part of all the chapters of your story. Make sure that those springs of living water bring life to everything that you do because God is so willing to answer that kind of prayer. If her earthly father was willing to do that for her, how much more is our heavenly father willing to do that for us? People ask why there's evil sometimes. And they got to the promised land and there were people that were the bad guys. And I think it's because we need a choice. God always wants to give us a choice. And we always have a choice whether we trust him or not. We also need to work in relationship with him. We need to grow. We need to have reasons to ask God what he's got to say and what he wants to do. And God is always looking for people that want his life, that are going to come for him to speak the truth like Caleb did, that will come for the water like Axa did, that will commit whatever the opposition like Caleb did, that will be willing to learn like Othniel. God wants all those character traits in us so that we can inherit all that God has for us. However long it takes, are we going to get hold of what God has for us? Whatever giants there are, are we going to trust him and are we going to possess that land? Whatever anyone says, are you going to have a steadfast heart and courageous faith? I pray you do. I pray you do. And I pray that this story of Caleb has encouraged you because we have the same God. Caleb was just a man, but he was a man that trusted God. He wasn't necessarily the biggest or the cleverest or the strongest, but he was a man that knew the truth, that spoke the truth and believed the truth. And he was faithful all the way through. Trust him in his God. Amen. God bless you. Inherit your land. Amen. <laughs>